How do games manipulate time? One of the most interesting things you can do in games is traveling through time. I'm talking about games like Prince of Persia, Braid, The Entropy Center, Quantum League and even Overwatch. They allow you to do what you always dreamed of, manipulating time at will, which can result in some absolutely mind-bending moments with different timelines crossing over, working together or causing absolute chaos. Unfortunately, you don't see a lot of titles using this mechanic. It's often pretty hard to properly design a game around, and can be even harder to build. But that makes it all the more interesting to talk about. Luckily, I have experience with building a time manipulation game, because I built the core time manipulation mechanics of Time Benders, an indie game about powerful wizards fighting each other with time manipulation. Unfortunately, it never really saw the light of day, but still. I'd love to teach you about everything I learned building it. So let's dive in. How do games manipulate time? When you're building a game, you will at one point be greeted with some kind of update loop. This loop is called every frame of your game. And it's the point where you put your logic for things that need to happen every frame, such as movement or physics updates. For instance, if I increase the X position of my player by one in this loop, it will move by one unit to the right every frame. There is, however, one big flaw in this approach. Computers run at different speeds at different times. How much they're doing at the same time, or how powerful their hardware is, influences how much work it could do every second. This means that you can't be sure how many times per second this update loop is called. If you're running 50 Chrome tabs in the background playing Smash Mouth's All Star, Somebody once told me the world is... Your computer will perform this update loop less times per second than if you just have one tab open with a Wikipedia article about potatoes. The less often this update loop can be called, the more laggy your game will be. Because of this, our player will move 100 meters to the right on one computer if the update loop is called 100 times per second, but only 30 meters on another when it's only called 30 times per second. There are two solutions to this problem. Either you force your game to run at a fixed frame rate, such as 60 frames per second, or you keep track of the time between two frames and use that for movement. That first solution is why some games like Dark Souls or any Bethesda game really break when you remove their frame rate locks. The game wasn't programmed to handle more than 60 update calls every second, so all of a sudden things start moving much faster than they were supposed to. The proper way to handle this problem is to use delta time, the time difference between frames to handle your movement and physics logic. In our example, it is as simple as increasing the player's position by 1 times delta time. You'll notice that our player moves much slower, but now it's consistent regardless of frame rate. If your computer is slower, the time between frames will be bigger, causing your player to traverse a greater distance between frames. If you have a very fast computer, the delta time will be very small, causing your player to take very small steps between frames. But in both cases, the player will have moved the exact same distance in a single second, which is exactly what we want. Now, what does this have to do with time manipulation? Well, once we use this delta time for all of our objects, all of a sudden it's very easy to change the speed of all objects in our game. We can make everything very slow or very fast by making this delta time smaller or bigger. All we have to do is scale our delta time with a time scale factor. And all of a sudden all of our objects move in slow motion. Alternatively, we can increase the delta time to make everything very fast. Or even freeze time with just one push of the button. All we have to do is apply some kind of scale to our delta time. Lower numbers will make the time go slower. And higher numbers will make it go faster. Nice. So already we can slow, speed up or even freeze time, but we can't reverse time yet. That is of course where the real magic begins. It is a bit more involved, but don't worry, I'll walk you through it step by step. It all begins with recording the information of the object you want to rewind. For instance, a cube. 
This means that every frame we have to save something about the cube. What position does it have? What rotation? How fast is it going? How fast is it rotating? How is it feeling? What's its mother's maiden name? What are the last four digits of its credit card number? On a scale of 1 to 10, how would it rate the current state of the Western capitalist market economy? Please give a detailed description of why it chose that number and what steps it could take to improve in them. Wait, wait, what, what were we talking about? Oh, right. We have to save its position, rotation and velocity every frame. Basically, we have to make sure that we record any property we want to reverse through time. Can it change color? Then we have to save its color. Does it lose health? Add it to the list. Can it go to the toilet? Well, record that shit. Once we have that, we can reverse time. When the time reverse starts, we simply go backwards through the frames we saved and set the cube's values to the values we saved, so we can make it look like it's going in reverse. And voila, we can reverse time. But I know what you're thinking. Digit, if we want to reverse time for all objects in the game, wouldn't we need to save all the data of all the objects in our world? And the answer is, unfortunately, yes. But we can take some shortcuts. Most of the time, we don't need frame perfect precision. We can get away with guessing the values between two saved frames. This way, instead of saving all the data every frame, we can only save the data every 10 frames. When reverse time, we can sort of guess where the cube was between those two points. For example, suppose our cube is at position 0 on frame 0 and at position 5 on frame 10. Now, if we rewind time, we can guess that at frame 8, it was 80% of the way there. So, we set the cube's position to 4. At frame 5, it was halfway there. So, we set the cube's position to 2.5, etc. By interpolating between these save points and guessing the values between them, we can save our computer a lot of work. Because it doesn't have to save all the data for every object every single frame anymore, and can just guess the missing data. That's basically how games like Braid and Prince of Persia can slow down time, speed it up and even reverse it. It's a shame there aren't too many games using these mechanics, because it feels amazing to use. Maybe you'll be the one who makes the next time manipulation game. But until that time, you're at least a bit wiser. But wait, we could go even further. There is a whole other layer to time rewinding we haven't even scratched the surface of. Ready yourself, because we're going even deeper into the subject. If this was already enough for you, then feel free to turn off the video and go about your day. However, for those who want to dive in even deeper, you can stick around and I will share with you the existential dread I experienced while working on this. All my suffering began with a simple question. What if we can't just manipulate time globally, but we can also manipulate the time of individual objects as well. That question was the source for a lot of blood, sweat and tears. So, so many tears. Anyway, welcome to the wonderful and confusing world of local time manipulation. But before we dive in, I quickly want to let you know that I've also released a podcast, Public Void Update. Together with my friends and colleagues, we talk about games, game-related news and game development. Join us in our casual conversations about our experience in the industry, listen to our discussions about games and any game-related events, and just have a good old time. If you want to listen to us blabbering, then tune in to our podcast, Public Void Update. Link is in the description. To get started, let's take a look at what it means to manipulate local time. Suppose we have a cube that's falling down. Like we mentioned previously, in order to reverse time, we need to record its position every frame. This time, however, we have to keep track of two timelines. In addition to the global timeline, we also need to keep track of the cube's local timeline. If we rewind global time, the same happens as before. We walk backwards through the timeline, set the cube's position stored for each frame, and remove that entry in our timeline. Easy enough, nothing's really changed yet. But what happens if we just rewind the local time for this cube? Well. Imagine what would happen from your perspective if the cube rewinded locally. You'd see it falling down, then when it rewinds locally, it would start falling upwards. And when it finished rewinding, it would start falling down again. These are all positions you have witnessed and stored in your memory. For our timeline, we do the same. Any position the cube is at is stored to our global timeline, whether it's rewinding locally or not. For the cube's own timeline, this is different. From the cube's perspective, its time has been rewinded and any rewinded frames are gone. 
This means that there is now a gap in the cube's timeline compared to the global timeline. That is exactly what we want. Because when we run the cube locally again, the cube shouldn't replay the frames it just erased. Because from its perspective, they were rewinded and thus never happened. Instead, it should rewind further back in time, across its own separate timeline, and play the frames that happened even further in the past. Because we keep tracking its position on our global timeline during all of this, when we ride time globally, we can see the path the cube traveled, and see it go back and forth playing its local time rewinds. As a developer, this has broken my brain more times than I can count. Even now, it takes me a little while to make sense of it. So, let's look at another example to get a better feel for it. Suppose we have a bouncing ball. We let it go, it bounces on the ground a couple of times, and then it falls off the edge. If we want global time now, it comes back up, bounces a couple of times, and returns to its starting position. Now, let's do the same, but introduce local rewinding. Again, we let it go, it bounces on the ground, and then it falls off the edge. This time, we rewind local time. It comes back, does a bounce, and we stop rewinding. Now comes the interesting part. What happens next when we rewind local time again? Does it bounce backwards or does it bounce forwards again? Think about that for a bit. What makes sense from the perspective of the ball? Well, if you ask me, the time rewinded locally has been erased. So I think it would make sense if it moved backwards even further, until it is back at its starting position. Next, let's throw global time rewinding back into the mix. What happens if we rewind time globally this time? Should the ball stay at its starting position? Or should it start falling again? I'll give you some time to think it over. Using the same logic we laid out before, when we rewind globally, the ball will go through all the motions we just observed. So first, it will start falling. Then, when we rewind it locally, the ball goes in the other direction for a bit. And eventually, after it has played back all the motions with all the local time rewinds in between, it returns back to its initial starting point. If it's still a bit confusing to you, just remember that in essence, the global time doesn't even know about local time. From its perspective, all the ball is doing is moving around in the world sporadically and simply records everything that's happening every frame. The other way around is also true. Local time doesn't really know anything about the global time. When we're running locally, all you're doing is just playing back previous frames and removing them. Whew! Okay, okay, so now we're done, right? We can speed up time, slow down time, and even rewind time globally and locally. What more could there possibly be? Well, at this point, functionally, everything works fine. However, for our game Timebenders, this was the point where we ran into some serious performance issues. We had to keep track of two timelines for every object in the game. And that was starting to eat up more memory than running 50 chrome tabs playing Belgian Technotronics pump up the jam at the same time. So, it was time for some optimizations. Get ready, because it's going to get even more complicated. Right now, we're storing a lot of data twice. Once on a global timeline and once on a local timeline. However, when we do some local time rewinding, we can see a pattern emerge. Every time we do a local rewind, a gap is introduced between data points. And after that, the values continue to be the same. These gaps are the only differences between the local and the global timelines. So, what if instead of storing a completely separate timeline for every object, we just stored the gaps? For time benders, we did this by adding time jumps to our global timeline. These jumps are only used when we rewind locally. Every time we finish a local rewind, we add a time jump from the point we started the local rewind to the point we finished it. Then, when we rewind locally, any time we encounter a time jump, we follow the arrow and skip to the frame the arrow points at in our timeline, to make sure we don't locally rewind the same part twice. Now, instead of having to store the data twice, we can just store the gaps in the global timeline where we rewind it locally, by adding these time jumps. If we look at the example of the bouncing ball again and compare the two approaches, we can indeed see that it is correct. We let the ball go, it bounces a bit, and then we start a local time rewind. 
When we finish the local time rewind, we add a time jump to our timeline. If we let it fall down again for a bit and then start locally rewinding again, we see that we can play back a couple of frames and then we encounter a frame with a time jump. If we then follow this time jump, we end up at the point our last local rewind left off. And we can see that we do indeed skip any of the frames we already rewinded. And we go back even further on our local time scale. While this does make the algorithm a lot more complicated, the performance improvement we got from it was well worth it. Doing this saved us a ton of memory usage, while keeping all the same time manipulating functionalities. And that's it! That concludes the explanation of the mind-boggling algorithm we created to make our own time manipulation game. If you are still watching after all that, then congratulations! You made it to the end of the video. Get some tea, go for a nice walk outside, you earned it. Don't worry if you didn't understand all the details right away. You can always go back and revisit them later. For now, give your mind a rest and take solace in the fact that you are, at the very least, a bit wiser.